So welcome to everybody listening now and in the future. I'm recording this presentation to the cloud. So for you all who are, are in my audience, uh, you will be um, you will be only seen if you um, ask a question. You can always type a question in the chat. Um, I wanted just to talk a little bit about why I decided to give this talk tonight. Um, I this this talk is part of uh, the professional uh, pre and perinatal practitioner platform. I have a series of lectures uh, once a month, and I I I give lectures there plus. I also ask people to come and give lectures. And my focus in the pre and perinatal online school is for skill building. And uh, for years, I ran the Department of Education at APA, the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health. But what I really wanted to do differently was to begin to bring forth skills. And I, I developed the online school and which allowed people to come in and, and learn a variety of skills. Uh, I have practitioners uh, who are very established, Ray Castellino, who's now ill, but he, he did a beautiful series for us. And I have um, Anna Chitty and Jim File and a wide variety of uh, practitioners who bring a quality to understanding pre and perinatal work that I, uh, so I wanted to focus on skills. And the most important skill, really, when it comes to working with earliest trauma is the, your, the presence that you bring. There's a lot of places where you can go and learn about um, sort of working with sensation or understanding trauma or understanding the skills to shift trauma or integrate it into our lives. But I feel like the the, the skill of, of really being present with earliest trauma is, is one of those basic skills that people can't practice enough. Uh, coherent, coherent states, oh, so, my, so many people are coming in. I have to make sure I get them, sorry. Um, <clears throat> when people approach me and they say they want to learn pre and perinatal work, um, I ask them, okay, well, how are you with survival states? Because you're going to encounter implicit memories in people that are are back at a time when there there were tremendous life death or um, wide and, and deep spiritual states and other kinds of things. So uh, I always ask people, how are you with the quality that you bring of your presence? So tonight, that's why I'm I want to focus on um, coherence. Because the quality of the space inside your own body is what is the tool that we start with. And also the tool of helping somebody else that you're working with, helping them understand um, their qualities. Some of the biggest mistakes I've made when working with healing earliest trauma have been not spending enough time stabilizing and resourcing. Often that's with the person that's come really is eager to go ahead and get started. And what I've learned over time is to explain that we have to spend time regulating our nervous system, coming into connection and developing anchored uh, states in the present so that we can go from that, those states to the more difficult places. So what I've done tonight is I've divided uh, my talk up into three different parts. The first part is, um, mini segment on what is prenatal and perinatal psychology. It's a small bit of a, of a larger lecture that I have in my free, free lectures, my free content. But I wanted to set some of the basics up for what exactly is it? Why, why are we focusing on coherence? And it is uh, one of the, those words that comes in pre and perinatal psychology, like where I, I have a whole list of people of words that I explore in that presentation. So I have a little bit of that. I talk a little bit about what is coherence and then incoherence and what is it that we're paying attention to. And then I have five tools 
actually six tools here and five levels of touch that are associated with touch. And I'm hoping to get through all of them in an hour and also give you some time to ask questions. So what do all these things mean? These are the things that I've, I've, when I was asked by one of my students, like, can you explain the language of pre and perinatal psychology? Um, I decided to create a presentation that would help answer some of her questions. And a, a lot of people are wondering what is pre and perinatal psychology anyway? Why is it called PPN? And what are these buzzwords? What do they mean? And coherency was one of them. So what I've done is I've created a presentation for just to describe the beginning part of this. And then, and then I wanted to go more into what a coherent state is, why it's important. And then those final six tools that we use in a pre and perinatal realm. So what is pre and perinatal psychology? And often when we started to talk about it in the days, like I've been doing this for almost 20 years, uh, people would ask, what does that mean? What is pre and perinatal psychology? Um, it, it is a study of the baby's experience starting preconception through the first year of life. This includes preconception, conception, prenatal experiences, birth, and attachment. And studies have shown that ancestral health, the womb environment, and how we are born and attached with our caregivers all have biopsychosocial effects that can have lifelong implications. Essentially, the experiences that we have as babies can last our whole lives. Um, even stuff that we know happens preconception now with epigenetics and transgenerational aspects, both trauma and uh, more strengths and character. Um, but we now know a lot about what happens starting preconception. So the study of pre and perinatal psychology is learning how these implicit memories can impact us our whole life. But it's really a misnomer. It's not really psychology. It's a holistic mind-body paradigm where the implicit somatic memory is active and alive. So the tools that we use are, are somatic, but we uh, developed our somatic platform over a over hundred years time, so beginning with psychodynamic work, um, um, psychoanalytic work, um, moving more into understanding the science. And then the past 10, 15 years, especially the growth of somatic therapies and mind-body therapies, and then the understanding of how memory works in the body and how, the role of epigenetics, and then also a relationship, especially attachment. So the, what? So in pre and perinatal somatic psychology, we understand that the baby, the body remembers the story. The body bears the, board, the burden, the body keeps the score. There's a pattern in there that can start. Sometimes the pattern can start preconception and just repeat over time. It can repeat in the prenatal period, it can repeat at birth and then after birth. The implicit memories is what we work with in the body. Um, this implicit time up until 18 months, 20 months of age, uh, a lot of things happen starting in utero, whether it, it can even start in the previous generations. So we're simply tracking. We're tracking the patterns that can come starting preconception. When the pattern is recognized and the nervous system response included in the awareness of the person you're working with, that is what's crucial to healing. So what we teach in pre and perinatal somatic psychology are these skills of presence and understanding our own nervous systems, but also we teach patterns of recognition that can start uh, with the baby's experience and they can show up in layers. So the, the layers of preconception, conception, and then a lot of things happen during the prenatal period and then the birth process, and then after birth. But why is it called PPN? So pioneering practitioners called it many things. They tried to, to call it primal therapy for a while, primal psychology. It was also known as rebirthing. Um, our pioneers like Leonard Orr um, and a, a variety of other uh, people that came through the personal growth period of our 
of our culture here and abroad. Um, they see that, uh, they, they, they called it, you know, rebirthing, but nothing really stuck. So some folks started calling it birth psychology. And uh, in that, that stuck, that has stuck around, but prenatal and perinatal psychology, even though it's three Ps, is really, we started calling it PPN. And, and that is what has stuck the most. So I call it PPN and it really is somatic psychology. So it's prenatal and perinatal somatic psychology. So when we're working with people, we have, we start them to in recognition of what is a blueprint and what is an imprint. And blueprint is a word that came to us through Randolph Stone. Randolph Stone is a polarity therapist and a big influence on several of our pioneer practitioners, including Ray Castellino and Anna Chitty. Anna Chitty and her husband, John, run the Colorado School of Energy Studies and have a, they, they created a really big focus on, on the blueprint. It is connected to understanding the biodynamic craniosacral therapy and the slower, um, more present rhythms in our bodies that are connected to the, to the breath of life and other patterns that you begin to feel when we're working with that therapy. So the blueprint, according to Anna Chitty, this is her, is an invisible universal, universal template that guides all formation. It's a torus shape. It's, un, it's inherent, it's underlying, it's in all living things. It's not just in human beings, but it has a slow pace. It has an expansion and a contraction. And then it rises and falls and folds and unfolds. It is slow, safe, and predictable. And it's something that when she teaches, she asks that you remember it, that this is something that's a part of the way that we learn that you as a practitioner, when you are working, you remember your blueprint, you remember your slower rhythms, your mid space. And I'm going to talk you through some of these places. You remember who you are in your body, who you really are. Uh, and when she, what she says, where two fields meet, a third field arises. This is actually the, the work of, of Becker and Roland Becker and other osteopaths who talk about the field. And, and I'm gonna explain what the field is too, but the, we all have an energetic field. People can feel it when they're with you. Everyone has it. And in fact, all of us here together have it. And just imagine that we are all here part of this process in a greater wider field as we come together around the topics in this talk. Now, when we're working with imprints, these are things that happen to us. They're not us. Um, we have a tendency to think that we are these things that happen to us, especially when they are so early, when we're just babies, when we're making our bodies in our mothers and in our families and in our societies and cultures. So an imprint is an impression. Um, it, it, it's something that we come into, into form with. It's something that we contact even before we come into our, into, our, into our first cell, into our first, into the egg and the sperm, into our first union. We are encountering the fields of our family lineage. It's some of the stuff that we carry doesn't even belong to us. We just inherited it as we came into form. But imprints are not just um, overwhelming. They're also positive. And, and we came in as a unique being, spirit and matter. Uh, um, and we're unique. We're, this is just our time. This, this matter, this spirit, this soul. And who knows why we're, we're here? What is our purpose? But we are here for a reason. So when we're, we come in and we have something that, that we want to do, we want to, we have a leading towards that we feel our purpose. And yet we can also carry these undigested parts from our family lineage or our ancestors or our parents. And if we don't integrate these parts, then they can become obscurations or hard places 
or blockages, sometimes we enmesh with them. We, we, we think that we are them. And that's, the, that's part of the therapy that we do when we do the somatic psychology with people is to help them understand their true nature, their truer nature, or their essence. Because we tend to think uh, that the things that we experience that are overwhelming can, are us. So the therapies in somatic psychology are designed to really help tease out all the layers of things. And then I recognize the patterns. And then we use the skills of coherence, um, which is connection to resourcing, which many of you who are on this call who are trauma resolution therapists will recognize. And we go from a more resourced state to the more difficult state and back that's a part of the therapy or we have enough capacity to sit with the imprint and recognize uh, what it is it's not us it's a memory and as we sit with it it transforms so uh, it's not really what you do that matters but how you are on the inside is a saying from karen strange and so as you are with someone, it's how you are on the inside that they will feel and that they can, you can help build up in them through tools, which I'm going to introduce some of them to you tonight. But when you feel your presence and remember your own blueprint, you remember that you have made it and that you are present. So in my mentoring with Anna Chitty, I, I would ask her, you know, I, what I've learned over time is to really believe fiercely in people, to believe in their capacities, to believe in them, that they are here for a purpose, that they are a soul, a spirit and matter like myself. They're not the imprint. But she said, it's more than just believing that, Kate. You have to remember your own blueprint and remember that you have made it and that you are present and the more that you can build that up the the greater success you will have in the there in the working with earliest trauma it's a somatic based experience and we know that our right next to some of these really early wounds are our deepest spiritual natures because that's who babies are that's who we were when we were babies and who we still are underneath all of our lived experience. As our, our true essence is right there. And as we sit with these more difficult, um, more difficult experiences from when we were babies, which often they're not seen and recognized and not taken in because they're not widely taught, at least not yet. We're getting to a place where we're getting there being able to recognize those experiences and having the capacity to sit with them, that's what will change. That's what will change that state. That's what will help that person that you're with integrate that early wound and then feel their true nature. So when we're working with resourcing, which is really essentially creating coherence, um, it really is anything that connects us to feel ourselves, to feel our health. It can start with an appreciation, like just, just, just an appreciation. So find something right now, all of you sitting here with me, us tonight, I think there are about 50 of us, find something in your life just to appreciate. Some place of beauty, a place of, um, of uh, some place of joy, a relationship that you really enjoy, uh, just something that you enjoy about your life right now, just find something to appreciate and just notice how it feels in your body. It's a slower pace, a certain amount of warmth and spreading. There can be a lot more flow. This is more fluid. It's not a fixated state. It can be a settling also, a feeling of connection or balance. It's a part of feeling embodied. It's like really noticing your body sitting in the chair. So resource sensations are a portal to who we to, to that to that slower pace, that 
that Taurus, that the form of, that's always there underlying us. It's an energetic quality, but it's also physical. You can feel the sensations of it. So when we're talking about the field, this is very common in pre and perinatal somatic psychology. We, we talk about the field and field theory and our connection. Uh, the biodynamic craniosacral therapy and osteopathy, polarity, all these um, fields of study very much have influenced pre and perinatal somatic psychology. Um, it is from physics and it's, it's a field of, it occupies a space, it's, it contains energy, it's a life space. And uh, one of the more popular uh, therapies that brought it more into uh, mainstream is heart math. Um, energy medicine has been around for, I don't, you know, centuries. Um, but heart math developed the technology to measure it. And so that's where a lot of coherence and incoherence became much more popular. Uh, it looks at how we can measure the field of the heart. And it's a therapy whereby if you put a positive sensation or emotion in your heart, it will regulate that heart beat so that the space after each beat, which is the heart rate variability, is a regular, uh, is very regulated. It's very even. And when you have a positive emotion and you, and you breathe slowly, which is they teach you to breathe between four and six beats in, four and six beats out, it starts to regulate the whole nervous system, but especially the heart. And so it, it, based on this, um, and also from the old studies of energy medicine, uh, we developed this idea of the field, the field, it's measurable. They developed a variety of technology to be able to measure our fields around us. They can go out as far as 20 feet. The heart has a field, the body has a field. And this again is the torus. They were able to, to measure it. It has two poles and it, it creates a three-dimensional space around. It's constantly ref refreshing and influencing itself. So that's why if you can be on top of how you're feeling and your sensations and just then just remember that this is who you, who you are. You have a slower, expansive rhythm that's always there. So the heart math and other variety of mindfulness therapies brought, brought us to look at how can we become more coherent. On one side, we have a here the, a coherent, you see the wave here that's very regular. This is a sine wave. And they've developed a lot of different tools now, not just heart math that measures heart rate variability. It's a way you can bring someone into a more relaxed, more present state. On the left side, you'll see incoherence, which is all these jagged, uh, this jagged, rough, often faster paced emotional states. That was the, what the heart math encouraged us to do, to find a regulated state, slow our breathing, and really focus on positive emotion. The emotions are, that are most frequently measured are, are gratitude, and appreciation and frustration. But when I was trained in pre and perinatal uh, somatic psychology, um, we were trained to think of things as coherent and cohesive. Um, so in coherence, like I said, there's a feeling of flow, of warmth, of connection and presence, a feeling of, of feeling whole, feeling unified, there's a smooth feeling to it. To me, there's an optimism and a brightness. Um, there's a feeling of feeling both grounded and buoyant. But we often would contrast that with the feeling of feeling cohesive. Uh, so a lot of people are just holding themselves together. Um, or they've learned that. They've learned that they can hold themselves together and get by, get through, make it through. Um, there's a certain tenseness to it and a rigidity. 
And also there can be a faster pace or a very slow, um, almost no pace. Um, it can be narrow and have a lot of survival energy into it. It's cohesive. So when I learned pre and perinatal work, I started many years ago, but really learning when I'm in a cohesive state, like when I'm really muscling my way through and when I have more coherence. And this was before polyvagal theory became really popular. Um, and then um, when I contrast it with incoherence, you know, when you look at the definitions, it's not logical, not understandable, not connected, not reliable, incoherent. So like I said, when we began measuring what coherence and incoherence was, it was through heart math. And when we measured the heart rate variability of the emotional physiology of the heart, um, you are able to recognize the slow, smooth sine wave of appreciation and the more jagged, unreliable, inconsistent wave of frustration. So heart math has gone very far in, with all kinds of tools to help measure coherency. And I used to have a little handheld thing that I would put, I would put in between my hands during between clients and just measure my coherent state. There was a green light or a red light or a blue light and you're able to really measure what was going on inside your body with these tools. But really what you're feeling is your own interoception, your own emotional state, which of course is connected to the vagus nerve and the polyvagal theory. And really understanding that how you feel in your body is going to create a story that you can that you tell yourself. And therefore you have to watch what it is that you're thinking and feeling. Um, so the state will drive the story. And if you have a memory, an implicit memory, a memory from being a child in your family or even being a baby or something from birth, which we find so prevalent, or something from our prenatal time or even something from our ancestors, it informs the states that we have in our bodies and it can inform a story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. So the therapy is really meant to really recognize when we are in an imprint, which basically is a memory. So finally, before I shift into talking about the tools, I want to talk for a minute about touch. Touch work, I think, is necessary to do pre and perinatal somatic therapy. A lot of people in various trauma resolution trainings now are very, it's very prevalent for them to learn a few touch techniques. But I think that really, uh, really understanding uh, when a person lies down on your table and you can work with a variety of touch skills. If you can bring your awareness to recognizing when these early states are present, you can combine a variety of tools, which is what the training is about to heal the baby's experience. And many people can recognize and do these therapies with adults. And many can also work with babies and many can work with couples and families that are that are having babies. So there's a variety of audiences that you can work with, but I do think that uh, touch is a necessary skill. So these are the tools I'd like to go over. Um, before I go into the tools, I'm gonna stop here and see if there's any questions. All right, so if there, are there any questions about pre and perinatal somatic psychology and coherency before I describe tools? I have a question. MB. Hi. Um, so many people don't really have the touch license, but I'm wondering about uh, prosody, voice, especially mm -hmm. with babies. And couldn't that be as effective to bring about a state shift than as touch? I don't think I don't think it's the same. 
but I do think you can evoke certain states with the quality of your presence and the quality of your voice. Uh -huh. And um, there are also a variety of sensation words that you can use with people. Um, and if you're working with babies, babies are, are, babies are feeling and yeah. when they'll, it'll, it's less about, I think the, it's about the quality of the way that you, you speak, because it represents how you feel in your body. But generally I have, I find that babies feel, and we have a saying, I think, you know, this saying MB, mm. the baby babies know, yeah. babies know, and, and they, they they can be very curious and they can also be very averse. They can, they're very sensitive to feeling. They feel you. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm more thinking about those who work with adults that have early trauma. Ah, okay. Um, but babies, you work with the parent. When you work with the parent and teach them to touch skills for their children. Um, so that's one of the other ways I would work if I do not have a license to touch. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Does anyone else have a question before I go on? Okay. Yeah. Mar Margie? It, it, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. So good to see you. Yeah. It's exciting. Um, with uh, Stephen Terrell's work, uh, transforming the experienced-based brain, which I know you've taken. Mm -hmm. uh, he has therapists in there who do not have touch skills, but are somehow able to do that work of just uh, holding the kidneys, holding the brainstem, holding the feet. Well, I think if you have a certificate like transforming the experiential brain or somatic resilience and reg regulation and resilience, the work of Kathy Kane and Stephen Terrell, right. I think that's, I mean, you're, you have advanced training for that. Um, also, in somatic experiencing, you were taught, they're taught table work. And I'm, I'm in favor of all these things. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that touch is necessary. And when I took that training with Stephen Terrell and I experienced the kidney holes, and it was actually working with Kathleen Love that brought me there. Right. I, rec I recognize that that particular touch sequence is strong enough to hold the, the earliest imprints. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's a good, a good thing to do, the, the transforming the, emo, the experiential brain. Yeah. So someone who's a psychotherapist and doesn't have the license for touching could take some of those classes and then be able and allowed to do the touch. Oh, I think Is they'd that... be able. I think it depends on the state that you're mm. in, how, how rigorous they are. And, mm. uh, and I would inquire of, if you're a psychotherapist, to, uh, to inquire of those people who have taken those trainings um, and how they handle how they handled their tra their transition into working with tables and touch. Mm -hmm. Good yeah, idea. I, th I think it's tricky territory, but well, I, I well, unfortunately, yeah. But I, I I do think touch is necessary when you're working with adults that have earliest trauma. I think that touch is language. Uh, for these early imprints. And I'm going to describe a little bit more how I do it um, when I get to the touch part of my tool sequence. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have a question before I continue? I, I, I do think that the quality of the presence that you hold and the level of of belief in the patterns of within both within yourself and others that there is an essential quality that lies underneath some of these patterns like this whole world of zoom and people have been able to have extraordinary experiences through zoom uh, surprisingly and it's the quality of the presence uh, that you have uh, with someone and also like like I said, underneath these early wounds are, are, are essences 
that want to rise, like, like compassion and forgiveness that are deep inside, that are coupled right next to these difficult places. So they're right there. And if the person that you're seeing for the therapies uh, that you would like have been in, into those territories and worked on them themselves, you can feel it just like the baby that I talked about with MB. Your inner baby will know. You're, there's a way that there, that's there. Um, so I, I, I'm in favor of teaching about these territories and helping practitioners of, of all different kinds understand what the layers are and how to work with them. Okay, I'm going to take you guys in and... I have a question. Yes, fine. Raquel. Yeah, hi. Um, I was thinking just about what you were saying there about the blueprints and um, reflecting on something I heard Thomas Hubel talk about recently about the resonance between clients and clients, almost traumatic, ex uh, client and therapists, traumatic experience and how you, as a therapist, worked with your own coherent blueprint to assist the client's maybe incoherent blueprint. But one of the things he was kind of, at least suggesting or alluding to was that there was a kind of a symmetry or a match um, between the client and the therapist in, he wasn't using the word blueprint, but he might have used the word blueprint in a way. And that's what I'm asking you is, do you think there needs to be um, a match of some sort or another between the client and the therapist for that transformation to take place? A match. I'm not quite sure. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, he referred to it as a resonance, but uh, it was um, it was. He was also speaking about the idea of that um, the trauma. The it was a it was healed trauma within the therapist mm -hmm. that um, created uh, it created this field of coherence that then. Um, created the healing in the client because there was a resonance between the healed trauma and the unhealed trauma. Yeah, that makes complete sense. It's like the, when people ask me, like, they really want to learn how all the babies experience. And it is quite compelling. Once you start to go down that path, there's something about it that, uh, that just, you just go until you there's no further to go and I'm still doing it 20 years later I mean it there, it is something very com the com compelling about understanding the baby's experience so well, you want a therapist that has gone down that path and someone who can be with it with those states and they may not recognize it as oh this is what happened uh, when the baby was in utero or had a birth experience but the states that can come from these early wounds can, can, are on a continuum from mastery to an ecstasy to, uh, to stress, getting stuck, uh, life, death, feel, uh, terror. I mean, there's all this range of, of experiences. So it's once you've encountered them yourself and then able to be with them, that, that is what the training is about, encountering and then being with them yourself. And then as you remember what's underneath that, when you're with someone in your own coherent state, that is what helps the person that you're with, along with the skills of inquiry and recognition and, um, and your listening, their capacity to listen as well as touch. So you can see it's not a straightforward uh, thing but yeah. I do I would agree with Thomas Hubble short <laughs> what, uh, as you're talking it uh, reminds me of, um, when I was in a training I uh, I was supporting someone to go through a, uh, the traumatic energy of some a really big um, ve motor vehicle accident mm -hmm. and I remember that energy and I, I mean I, that's not something I've ever experienced but that energy when I when we finish the process I had this kind of big aha moment of, oh, that's the kind of energy states that I've had to hold in my family of origin, even though it had, it didn't, like, I mean, it wasn't about a vehicle accident. 
But right. I, I, I felt it and realised, is oh, that's why that was easy for me. Like it was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it created quite a lot of stir because it was a really big thing and it, was, and it seemed really easy for me. Right. And that was because of that resonance. So now I understand. Yeah. It's a state. Yes. It's a simple state in the body. You had the scary experience in your family, whereas your client had the similar scary resonant experience in a car accident. Yeah, so there's a story connected to the state, but if you drop the story, the then, what, then you can still be with the state. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, with these stories that I'm going to tell you about the tools. So let me go in and start to tell you a bit. And we have, we have until, we have about 20 more, more minutes here. Okay. So the capacity, coherence is the step that you want to enter into. You want to find a way to bring someone that you're with, and even in yourself, especially in yourself, into coherent state, a slower deeper, wider, more regulated, connected to the very present moment. Like Ray Castellino has a way of saying present age, present eyes. You, you, want, you want to anchor people in the now. So um, you use your senses. You use the smell, you touch, proprioception to what's actually happening in the moment. And one of the first exercises that we do quite often is this center ground and neutral. So this is an image from um, Heidi Hansen. If you all don't know her, I mean, her website is she's just a, she has a, she's a practitioner, but really has been learning to, to heal her own PTSD. And she does these wonderful drawings. And this is from her website. Um, but this, the very basic one that we do first with most people as you feel your seat and your feet and your breath. And what you're making, what are you making contact with? So when people can't feel their bodies per se or don't have a lot of experience in their bodies yet, this is the very first thing that you can do. Okay, what what are you sitting on? What is it like to sit on it? Is it smooth? Is it hard? And are you sitting more on one side than the other? And you get people thinking. You get people feeling into their body like, oh yeah, I'm sitting more on my left side. And you begin to notice what it is that you do with your body when you're just paying attention, your feet and your seat and your breath. So in the quality of center ground and neutral, you're just noticing your body in time and space. And as you're sitting there, is there an image that rises up? Especially if you can orient to what we call the mid space. This is, this is the middle of your body. This is the central channel. This is that mysterious midline that appears. It's part of the mystery of you. So it's just now sitting there with me tonight to see if you can find your own mid space. And then just notice what happens in your body. It can be a line. It can be a column. Uh, So, hold on a second. Someone's chatting. All right. So then the next step is just to just notice your own inner voice. Are you, is there chatter? See if you can drop beneath what you're thinking. Like lower the noise is is what, these are two people I talked to, Anna and Margaret. Lower the noise and set your intention to perceive a subtle sensation, the energy around you. And see if you can just align with, with who you are. Like you are not what happened to you, right? You, you were there, but you are differentiated from that. There is you and there is what happened to you. So see if you can just orient to yourself and imagine that's like sitting in a warm, shallow ocean that's all around you, calm and gently fluid. Just be here now. 
See if you can find places in your body where there is more ease, softness, feelings of flow, feelings of groundedness, like weight or lightness or both. So as you practice this, you can become, your mid space can get bigger and wider. And often when we're with people and their story and their work and the work we do is compelling, we may find ourselves leaning, leaning in or leaning back. And just see if you can find that central ground in neutral. And then begin to notice when you effort, when you start to lean in. It is a practice. And we all do have a tendency to to lean in or lean back or lean one way or the other. Practice just feeling your own center and then your feet and your seat and your breath. And in perinatal work, we have a meditation that we do that really helps with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through it. I'm going to do it the way I do it. Um, Ray does it a little differently than I do. Uh, I've, I've been influenced by a lot of people. Um, and this meditation, is, it, bring, it weaves together my experiences with Ray and Mia Califf and Anna Chitty, Myrna Martin, and a, a host of other people. And all the books I've read, it, it's, um, we all are, you know, others. Others have influenced all of us. But the idea of Mother Earth, Father Sky came through us uh, through Randolph Stone and this very old idea um, that we step down into creation, that we are um, spirit first and we step down into our bodies um, and we come as spirit uh, and, and then we emerge with matter and then we connect to the earth. Um, and then the what I was told when I learned this meditation is that it follows the same patterns of our embryological growth. So the back and the front, the right, left, inside, outside. So just find yourself in your chair. I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to. Your feet and your seat and your breath. And then imagine from the sky above you, a light comes down into your head and fills the central mid space or the central channel or a column, like a trail of light comes in it's from the sky. This is the vertical plane, your mid space going up. And then the next step is just to imagine the horizon. Imagine a vista where you can see where the earth meets the sky, like a beach or a mountain view. And just notice your lower body. Notice your legs and your hips and your feet. And imagine that you have roots growing down to the earth. feeling your connection to the earth. And then shift your attention to the back part of you. This is the backs of your legs, your hips, your back, the backs of your arms, and the back of your head. And then shift through the mid space to the front part of your body, the fronts of your legs, the front of your torso, insides of your arms and your face. And then, then shift to the right side of your body and get a full experience of the right side. The right leg, right hip, right side of your torso, right arm, right shoulder, right side of your face. And then shift through the mid space the left side of your body. I really love doing that, it feels so cool. Just feel the left leg, 
left hip, left side of your torso, left shoulder, and left arm, and left side of your face. And now bring your attention into the body. Have you feel your muscles and your bones? So the way I like to do that is just tighten up all your muscles for a second and then let them go. And just do a body scan starting from your feet going up. Noticing your muscles and your bones and your legs moving up, moving your awareness up and into your visceral cavity. And just taking a moment to thank your organs for all the work they do in your body without you having to tell them so. And moving up through the diaphragm into the lungs and then get a sense of your heartbeat. I invite you to put your hand on your heart if you wish. And then drop an image of beauty or something that you're grateful for in there. Moving your attention now up and into your brain, thanking all your neuroendocrine organs up and around your brain and your fluid systems there. And then bringing your attention to the outside of your body your skin, where your clothing meets your skin, a space around you, and very gently turning your head left and right, just waking up your orienting reflex, looking around the room with your present age, present eyes, and finding something in your space that helps you feel like you're here, like you're safe. That's a Mother Earth Father Sky meditation that I do. I do it with my students. I do it a lot and I do it every day. Um, I did it kind of fast because we don't have much time. Um, well, we really don't have much time. So I'm probably going to go just a little over because I wanted just to get through the end here. The next tool is stabilization. And for those of you who work with trauma who are listening, know that this is like what you do most of the time with people. You, you are in your, in your own regulated body, your brilliant body. You help someone else by being in the space with them, listening and helping them notice their own states and helping them shift into a more stable place. When anyone comes to you with, with trauma, that's first step always. And I, I help people by orienting them to their own structure to places where they feel strong or more secure, relationship with things that are always there. Um, and then, you know, in their body and their bones and in their muscles. Um, I'm particularly fond of a sequence I learned from Bridget Vixnens. I don't know if any of you out there have studied with her. She is a practitioner in Maryland and uh, I use touch here. So I will tell you about that later, but I, I really have enjoyed um, uh, learning a touch sequence and then I use questions of inquiry around where people like to be or how is it that to feel their muscles and their bones and I slow the pace uh, and when that I, in which I'm with them and allow them give them time to feel but stabilization is always first and there's self-touch you can teach around this as well squeezing and touching and pushing into the, your own thighs feeling your own bones Then resourcing, which is very common um, with anyone who studies somatic experiencing. There's, a, there's a, a way that we connect with places in our lives where we feel more whole or more ease or more warmth or more empowerment or more, more support. And it really helps us identify states. There is a continuum uh, between our own internal state and the story that we tell ourselves. So we're working on a continuum we're working with the nervous system. We're working with helping fe people feel more resourced states, things that help them feel good about themselves. We work with the polyvagal theory. Many, many of you out there, I'm sure, are aware. And we bring people into this more optimal zone. Um, 
So this is a map that comes from Anna Chidi. And she was influenced by uh, Peter Veen, Little Veen, and she tall, calls this the river of life. I tend to work with this kind of map more often than the latter map. But on any given day, we have a certain amount of nervous system function. You're able to recognize when you're inside this window, this window, uh, which window of tolerance came from Dan Siegel, but also the window of presence or what, you know, functional range, whatever words you use, are you, what are you doing throughout the day? How are you in your nervous system? So when you're working with someone, you help them bring them in more into a resource state this is, you can identify internal, external, and missing resources. You can also help people recognize the different resources that they have when they feel more safe, when they feel, you know, f fight or flight, how are they, what helps them in those states. There's a lot that you can do with resourcing. Well, we always start here with stability and resource. So when someone some comes to see me, I often will say, so what happened to you that was good today? Or what do you like to do? What do you enjoy? And as you remember that, what happens in your body? So I work a lot with sensation and helping them explore things that help them feel most like how they like to feel. And then I deepen into that resource. And this is an exercise that Anna Jetty teaches, but it's basically as you notice the memory of, say, paddle boarding or hiking or, you know, doing art or listening to music, uh, what helps that moment feel most alive for you? And then what happens in your body? And you can begin basic inquiry. What happens next? And then you refresh the memory. You broaden to stabilize, which means you bring more awareness of now in the present, the present time. You find a place that's not too far away from what, where they're, what they're exploring, but you stay present. You resource, right? what feels good, what's working. It's supposed to be from, not Ram. From the resource, touch the challenge and come back to the resource, right? This is our basic method to help transform a more difficult state. And my, my, final, um, my final tool, and then I can stop and take questions if people need to go, they can, um, is touch. Uh, so I, like I say, I, I really feel like I, I teach a lot of touch and touch skills. Um, the first one is always stabilizing. So firm, still touch. You find the sweet spot. It's not too much, not too little. Um, and you have people feel their body, their structure, their bigger bones and bigger muscles. I usually start with the legs where people can feel their connection to the earth. And while I'm working with them, I'll often ask them, you know, where do you like to be? Where do you like to go? Some place in your, in your yard? Do you walk? Do you like to go out in nature? where do you like to go with your body? You know, and then as you remember being there, standing there, making connection with that tree, or uh, sometimes it can be a room in their house. But I, it, I often connect the lower body and the bigger muscles and bigger bones there where we give up flexibility for strength. That is often where I will start with firm, still touch. And then I do something called moving relational touch where I squeeze into the arms. And I, I learned about arms and arm gestures in pre and perinatal somatic psychology as when the baby reaches, because the baby will reach, the baby reaches to be, um, to be picked up and to be communicated with and to be connected. So that gesture of the arms um, I'll often use touch into the, into the joints and into the arms and down into the hands. And then I'll ask people about people or pets, other beings that are important to them, and then have a level of inquiry around how is it to be with them as I'm squeezing into their joints. And it's very gentle. Little squeezes can elicit oxytocin. 
And also um, the synovial sac acts like a shock absorber. So I do a lot of little, little squeezes into the joints, especially the shoulder joints and the finger joints. And sometimes I'll do something called tidal touch. I mean, and I've put the names of people who've influenced me next to these places, like Bridget really helped me with stabilizing touch. But tidal touch comes from Frank Carbone, which is, I mean, I've watched him bring tissue back to life as it, I mean, with his very slight little touch and mo slightly moving in and out and then moving your attention away a little and back. I've, I've, worked with him and watched tissue that he touches just become much more fluid and much more full and warm. And I learned from watching him and being with him. So I will also employ that. And I'm in process workshops after birth, I will employ a little bit of tidal touch to really bring coherence into the body. Cranial touch is very light and, and you, you can feel the fluid systems as a cranial practitioner. And I, I've taught non-cranial practitioners how to feel it. Um, and it brings them a lot of joy to be able to feel these really um, deeper but very subtle rhythms in the body. And then the final touch I'll, I, I teach and I use is called, bio, it's a biorhythm. It's following the breath with little touches, um, little touch in and touches out along with the breath. And so um, I call, that's touch that I learned from the eye of the needle. Um, and I, I think that people generally feel very well when you can do this following their, their, their breath with your hands. So these are the levels of touch that I use. But in summary, I would say that pre and perinatal somatic psychology is a, is a pattern language. It, we're looking for that implicit sort of somatic pattern. You can see it in their posture and their shape and sensation. And then in movement, sometimes their languaging, how they speak, and then in the quality of their presence and your presence. Healing wants to happen. It's, it's part of the way patterns work in the body. Your own implicit memories and your own things that are, that are inside your body that want to heal, they want to express themselves. They'll wait for the conditions. The conditions on the outside of our body will, or in our lives, will allow these patterns to rise. And when they do, we'll know how to meet them with a variety of tools. Mostly it's differentiation, knowing that you're having a memory. And from there, you work with them to feel more present, more in the now, starting with coherence and stabilizing, stabilization. So there are layers of experience in pre-perinatal realm. Um, and when we're working with them, they start preconception, but they can have a variety of, of influences. That's why we work with concentric circles there are ranges, there are places that, and they can often repeat, but there are distinct layers of the baby's experience. Oh, and within those, you know, they can start like preconception, they can involve our parents in the parents relationship and have nothing to do with us. It could be something at conception or prenatally or during birth or after birth, which is where I find a lot of the most difficult patterns are. We're navigating our first two years, which is known as the first thousand days. And how can you learn pre and perinatal work? I have a online school, which is happening right now. Uh, I'm sure after COVID, there'll be a return to some of the better and more present, more somatic trainings. But Ray Castellino has just offered this um, class in our school. You can still purchase the recordings. There are new uh, things coming. There's teachings with Anna Chitty and Jim File and our own somatic collective, which are some of the uh, more advanced students of Ray Castellino who are stepping out to offer their own seminars. So this is me. So I'm gonna stop here and take questions and um, also thank you for your attention. These lectures are usually only an hour. So, um, but I'm sorry I went over a little. I'm happy to stay and ask questions. And um, 
happy to stay as long as anyone needs wants to talk but if you need to go I totally understand <laughs> hey Kate I know this is kind of a loaded question but can you speak at all to how you've had to change your process how you're able to do it over zoom during these times how I'm able to do my work over zoom yeah like um, with especially like with your last point about the like bio touch the, the bio rhythm touch yeah well um well man I usually start just like I said, with my own capacity to be present. And then I lead someone into feeling a more coherent state, just like I did said, I'm like, what, what's good? What's happened today? I mean, if we had more time here, I would say, Kristen, would you like to do a little piece of work so people could see? I mean, it, it's really, um, we have found it to be extraordinarily effective uh, just to lead people through feeling themselves. And then you ask them what it is they want. So you always work with intention. When I'm listening to their intention, um, that's like a facilitated sort of like what it is they want. I'll work towards that. But I always start with resourcing. And from the more resource place in the body, you anchor in present time just with inquiry and asking them about their body's response. Like I have some of my favorite questions, like what happens in your body? How is it? to be with that what is your experience right now I mean I have a whole level of inquiry my own favorite questions and um, you can also work with imagine touch and self touch um, but I, I have found it to be to be pretty effective in helping people slowing the pace and then noticing themselves thank you so um, much thank you for your question um, Giselle I see your hand up. Is your is your microphone working? You have to turn go and unmute by selecting the mute button. You go to the lower left hand side. There okay, you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Two couple of questions. Um, will will this be posted so we can look at it again, listen to it again? Yes, I'm going to put it up in YouTube and I'll send you the link. Okay. The other question is, are you still involved with PPNE? From uh, no, no. I worked there for six years and yeah. I, I've left now and I have my own training programs. I want, so no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But I wrote that program. I wrote that and I ran it for six years. I, that's, that's good long enough for one person to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, okay. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, Margie, did you want to? Right. I, I'm assuming somewhere here there's some website to look at what your training really um, entails yeah well it's um if you go to ppncenter.com mm -hmm. that's my website and i'm that's my educational website i have a practitioner website too which is called belvedere arts mm -hmm. okay um there i've typed them both up there and then okay the chat. great thanks um, sure yeah and I'll be, I come down to Chapel Hill a lot, Marty. <laughs> come so, by. I right will. next door. Okay. <laughs> okay. That would be great to see you. Okay. Could, we could visit out on the back porch with our All masks right. on. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, we'll yeah, that'd be great. To be continued then. <laughs> great. Fantastic. This is very exciting. Thank you, Margie. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kate. It was great to see you and hear you again tonight. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. You're always an inspiration, you know, and kind of get the low spot. It's always Kate just has the ability to just boost you up and keep you going. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Hi. Good night, everyone. Good night. I'm just gonna stay here with you until you leave. So I'm gonna wave. It's very it nice to be able to join you at um at a at a, a nice time in Australia today.
Oh, good. Yes, Australia. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. nice to be here in Brisbane, so it was perfect. It was yeah. Well, I hope to make it over there. Thank you for coming, Raquel. Uh, when, when they let, when they, when they open up the doors again. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kate. I thought it was a New Zealand accent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Goodbye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks Bye. for coming. Thank you.